372 years worth of history steeped into this one coin, which has made its way around the world throughout history to find itself in focus here on my channel. Hello everybody, Backyard Bullion here, and a very warm welcome to you all joining for 2021's first video. We've done it, we've got through 2020, the year we can now just forget about and put behind us, and hopefully 2021 will be a little bit better than its predecessor. We're certainly kicking it off in style with this week's edition of In Focus Friday, where we have a look at something very cool, and 372 years old at that note as well, made of silver. It is a Netherlands Lion Dollar, or as it might have been called, the dog dollar, because sometimes the lion was not quite so evident that it was a lion, and a lot of people thought it was a dog. Now this coin has come to me courtesy of Auger over on the Silver Forum. He thought it would be a very interesting coin because of this huge planchet crack that we've got in it, and of course its age and just general collectability as a very cool coin. It's in a pretty good state as well, MS63. Uh, some of you might be looking at the giant crack and thinking, how is that mint state 63? Well, mint state is exactly that, how the coin came from the mint and a planchet crack is something that's very interesting and very collectible. So I will do my best to give this coin justice here today and showcase it and tell you a little bit about it from my limited uh, amount of research that I can do just through Google searches. When it's a 372 year old coin, there is often not a lot of information about some of the earlier kind of mintages, uh, you know, mintage figures, usage and things like that. It's all of, of course passed down through history and a lot of that information is often misinterpreted, lost or wrong. So I've just kind of collected what I can find out about them. So lion dollars, what is a lion dollar? First of all, you can see all the details from NGC up here, 1648 Netherlands, one LD lion dollar. It's called a lion dollar because it's got a lion on it. No surprise there. However, I did say at the start that people called it a dog dollar as well because it's pretty dog-like, I have to say. Like, you know, yeah, it's a lion, but these coins were very heavily used. And we'll talk a little bit about their usage in a moment, but they were trade tokens. They were the international money of choice back at this particular time period, certainly in some of the newer colonies of the United States, New York in particular. And a lot of the time they'd be so worn down that you wouldn't actually be able to identify it was a lion. So a lot of people called it a dollar. Oh, sorry, a dog dollar. Now the word dollar is interesting because it is the very first dollar that was used in the United States. So it's got a little bit of uh, sort of pedigree. I'm, I'm trying not to make all of these dog uh, puns, I swear. This pedigree that goes with the dog dollar of having that title of the first dollar to be used on the continent of, the, of America, which I think is really quite cool and quite interesting. So made in Netherlands, of course, the Netherlands at this particular time period, this one is dating from 1648. Now, I don't know whether this is an actual 1648 version. I believe it is. Uh, that's my understanding of it, because there are plenty of others that were minted between uh, well, sort of this time period and the, the, the early 1700s, but I don't know whether they were kind of restrikes like the Austrian Thalers, which incidentally took over from these as the European kind of trade currency or trade item of choice. Um, so I don't know if this is an actual 1648. I think it is. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody, please, but I am understanding it that way. And um, as I said, they were, they, were, they were basically used by the Dutch East India, India Company primarily as this kind of international trade token. So at that time period, they would be found all around the world, literally all around the world. But the new Dutch colonies in New York were specifically using them as that kind of trade currency. Of course, it had almost like this backing. You see, it's almost like the dollar is today. It's got this international renown, international recognition. And I read online doing my research that a lot of the trade merchants at the time would prefer to be paid in this rather than any other sort of local currencies because it's just more reliable. It had this backing, it was more recognized. And I think that's really, really interesting Like to have that history there. We still see the same principles being put in place uh, you know, now today as we did 370 years ago. Uh, in a very, very different world. So I think it's really interesting to see the history of that. I've always loved history when it comes to coins and thinking about the, um, you know, the journeys that coins have been on and it's just really fascinating to me. Now, in terms of journeys, 
of this particular coin. Actually, before we talk about the journey, I just want to talk about this side here. So this side is just an armoured knight looking to the right. That's pretty much all I can find out about it. I don't know if it's a specific figure. I haven't been able to discern whether it's one of the kings of the Netherlands or not. Um, but that is the armoured knight star staring off to the left with his shield and everything. And then, of course, the lion dollar on the other side. So there we have it. Now, in terms of before I get onto the journey, sorry, there's another few things to talk about. It's 75% silver. And in fact, the 75% silver is an important thing just to talk about there uh, because it's not sterling. It's not necessarily uh, as kind of the alloy isn't as perfect as sterling would be in terms of its strength and durability. Uh, so that's an interesting factor that could potentially have led to this planchet crack. Now, a planchet crack. What is a planchet crack? So a planchet, by the way, is basically just the blank version of the coin before it is struck. So what has happened here? This huge crack has appeared in the coin. Now, you can see that the coin, if we hold it up like that, that's actually a really good example. The coin is not perfectly circular. You've got to remember that back in the uh, 1600s, you know, manufacturing techniques would vary from mint to mint, from person to person. Even the person in the mint, the skill level there, would vary from person to person. And the creation of a perfectly circular piece of silver was not always as easy as it might look. And I can definitely sympathize with that uh, from my own you know, experiences of pouring bars to try and get them at exactly one ounce or in exactly the right shape or flatness. It's not easy. And sometimes you would get a piece that comes out, you know, blank, that would come out that looks like this with just a tiny little bit of imperfection in its circular form. And you would think to yourself, do you know what? That's good enough for me. That one is just going to go in the pile of yeses because it's going to cost me way more time and energy and effort just to start again and try and get it any better. So that's kind of like the mentality and I can definitely understand that and sympathize with that. But what has happened here, which is the most interesting thing, is that evidently when the alloy was being created, the 75% alloy, it was not necessarily treated in the perfect way. It wasn't necessarily alloyed in a perfectly homogeneous way, which means it's not necessarily perfectly distributed with its silver and non-silver content throughout the coin. And consequently, when it was struck with the dies, now often with these types of coins, you would have the coin sitting on a die and then you would have another die struck down on the other side. And you can see here that they don't match up with um, their alignment in any way at all. That's very common because it's all done by hand. So you would have the other side held down on top, kind of like I do with my stamping. You just hold the stamp on it and then you bash down as hard as you can to get this uh, to get this pattern embossed on it. But it stretched, it's well, it stretches a coin. So when you have a coin in something like that and you're pushing down on it, the silver has to go somewhere. And in this situation, it stretched and it ripped open and apart the coin, which is really interesting. Now, in terms of the collectability and added value of Planchet cracks, I read online that they are exceptionally popular. You know, you see these kind of coins with these imperfections. It's almost like it, it is a mint error in its true form. Uh, it's really interesting to see how even a small crack can cause this huge kind of added, added amount of collectability on it. And as you can see, it doesn't affect the grading from, uh, from NGC here. This crack is not like it's an aftermarket crack that's come from removing it from jewelry or it's you know, a giant scratch or you've dropped it on the floor and it's cracked. This is a mint state 63 coin. This crack has come as a consequence of what's happened at the mint, not afterwards, which is an interesting distinction to make. So a crack this size is, I think, a really good one. And I can understand the collectability of this kind of thing because it's really unique. Of course, every single planchet crack will be completely different and that yields a often really nice, unique part to it. It also unif uh, unifies, not that's not the word, uh, uniquely identifies the coin, that's right. So uh, it's gonna obviously be almost impossible to replicate this coin and have the exact same crack on it. So it is unique, it is different, and that's probably why you see uh, something like this in such good condition for its age and for its type. It must have been seen by somebody somewhere and talking about its journey. Let's just make up a little fun story for it. So it was made in the mint, it was taken out of the mint, put into circulation, and perhaps the first time it was actively used or somebody got it out of their little coin pouch to pay for something, they went, oh, oh, that's a bit different. That's my lucky coin. And they put it in a sock drawer. If you had socks back in the 1600s, they put it in a little you know, vanity drawer and they left it there and they didn't think about it for centuries. And then it was found, passed down as little family heirlooms in coin collections 
throughout the ages until it came to Orga on the Silver Forum. Obviously went off to NGC. I don't know if Orga did that or whether he bought it in this state. Went off to NGC. Somebody went, yeah, that's very nice. Let's protect that. And now it's here on my table being showcased to all of you here on YouTube. What a journey through time this coin has seen. Really interesting. Very, very cool, unique coin. Definitely one uh, for uh, the books in terms of uh, my bucket list to see and have and enjoy for the short time that I will get to have it anyway. And uh, a big thank you to Orga on the Silver Forum for allowing me to showcase it and sharing it with all of you. I think it's wonderful. I think it's lovely. There has been, by the way, a modern restrike of this from the Dutch Mint, and uh, I didn't get any of them, but they were very, very popular, it seemed. Um, you know, expensive pieces of silver, the modern restrikes, but uh, again, with any kind of proof that's around a piece uh, that is steeped in history, that has got lots of connections to the past, you know, it's always going to be a popular thing. So really interesting, really nice coin. Would love to know your thoughts on it. Do you have some? Do you have some that have planchet cracks? It'd be very interesting to hear from you guys out there. So please do feel free to comment down below with your thoughts and opinions on this coin and say a big thank you down in the comment section to Orga for helping with this uh, in Focus Friday to kick us off for 2021. I hope it's been a fun one to get us started and I can only anticipate what we might be showcasing and talking throughout the rest of this year. So a big thank you to everybody for watching. If you have enjoyed this video, you know what to do. Hit that thumbs up button. It really helps everything that we do here on YouTube. And if you want to see videos like this in the future, or if you want to see some of the videos we've done like this in the past, hit subscribe and go and check out our playlist down below. Otherwise, that's it from me. A big thank you to all for watching. See you on the next one. And as always, please make sure that you like, share, comment, and subscribe for more.